All the Young Dudes, Sirius's Perspective, by Roller Coaster Words. Chapter 13. First Year, Lecticula Magna. Tuesday the 27th of December, 1971. One good thing came from Walpurga's letter, an idea. During the strange sleepy days between Christmas and New Year, Sirius attacked the bookshelves in the library with a vengeance, sure that he was close to a breakthrough. Previously, he had been focused on eyesight, how to alter the letters that Remus looked at, but he kept hitting dead ends. It was difficult to figure out how to keep the words straight, especially when Sirius didn't fully understand what exactly it was that Remus saw each time he looked at the page. But he hadn't needed to see the howler to understand what it was saying. Remus refused to accompany him to the library. He acted as though the books would bite him if he even tried to enter, so Sirius lugged armfuls of volumes back to the common room. They would sit in companionable silence in front of the fire, Sirius reading and Remus playing chess against himself with Peter's chess set. He didn't seem to understand any of the rules, but he thought it was very entertaining to watch the little pieces march around the board. When Sirius wasn't researching, he and Remus were breaking the new godstones in from James, or listening to T-Rex, or trying to transfigure Frank Longbottom's slippers. He got very cross with them one evening when he found them covered in slime. Sirius had been trying to turn them into snails. He kept as busy as he could, but there were still moments when Sirius's feelings crept up on him. The snarled mess of guilt, shame and rage stirred up by the visit to his family had transformed into a predator in the back of Sirius's mind, tail flicking, waiting for an opportunity to pounce. He would see the scattered Slytherin students in the great hall at meals and remember Bellatrix's awful smile or he would look up after a moment of intense concentration in the library, déjà vu settling over him, the towering shelves reminding him of his family library at home. Or Remus would say something funny, and Sirius would laugh until his sides hurt, until he was gasping for breath, until he'd find himself thinking, I wish Fred were here. This confusing mess of emotion only upset Sirius, adding to the simmering anger he'd tried to lock away. Luckily, he knew exactly where to focus his building resentment, Severus Snape. Remus seemed just as eager to plan their revenge, still furious about Snape's prank with the hare. He took a slightly different approach than Sirius, though. We should get James's cloak, follow him around until he's alone, and then beat the shit out of him. They were sitting in the empty common room, and Remus's voice was close to a growl as his fingers dug into the leather armrest of the settee. Now, now, Lupin, Sirius tuttered, arms full of books. You're thinking like a muggle. If we're going to get him, we're going to get him with magic. Not more books, Remus groaned, mouth twisting like he'd just tasted something sour as Sirius plopped down beside him. Yes, more books. Yes, more books. Sirius flipped open a heavy tome, but the cover rested across both of their legs. You'll love them once you get to know them, I promise. He was getting close, now, to finishing the research on the reading solution. He'd figured out what spells he'd need and he only had to find a way to cobble them together. In fact, he'd already started trying different variations in the library, where Remus was sure not to discover him, but Madame Pince had threatened to ban him after a succession of failed attempts that had resulted in books screaming aloud. So what's this one about? Remus asked, although he didn't sound very enthusiastic about the question. Hexes and jinxes. A lot of them are really complex, though. I mean, we're good, you and me. And James, anyway. But I think we should stick to the basics. Simplicity is key. Okay, Remus muttered. So I thought we could brainstorm all of the stuff we can do and see if that lends itself to any good jinxes, Sirius continued on cheerily, undeterred by his friend's lack of enthusiasm. So I'm really good at transfiguration. I got the best marks even after you started catching up. Right, Remus nodded. And James is a bit better than me at defence against the dark arts, which you'd think would come in useful when dealing with a slimy creep like Severus. But we haven't really learnt any good spells yet, except disarming stuff, and that's no use. He chewed absentmindedly on his quill, a habit his mother hated, but she wasn't here, and continued. James is good at flying, too, obviously, but I don't know how that's going to be any help. Then there's Pete. He's good at sneaking around and doing grunt work, I suppose. One nice thing about not having James around was that Sirius didn't have to try quite as hard to hide his disdain for Peter. 
It was true that the boy had grown on him. He would be funny sometimes, and he always was up for a game of chess or exploding snap. But he was just so desperate for James's attention, and he was nowhere near as good at magic as the rest of them. Pete's good at herbology, Rima suggested, and potions. Both useless, Sirius shrugged. You were the one who came up with the rose hips thing. And we're never going to beat Snape for potions. I hate to admit it, but the bastard's good. It wasn't like he was being mean about Peter. Just honest. Anyway, then we've got you. You're probably the best at charms. Not best, Remus said quickly. I'm good at levitation, I suppose. That's it. Sirius rolled his eyes, waving his hand impatiently. Oh, shut up. Now is not the time for modesty, Lupin. You pick up spells quicker than anyone. If we find any sufficiently horrendous hexes in here, then I'm counting on you to figure out how to do it. Remus shifted uncomfortably, even though he was just stating facts. Sirius ignored his friend's blushing, focused instead on the task at hand. It has to be something big, he murmured, flipping all the way to the back of the book and making Remus yelp when the full weight of it thudded onto his lap. Sirius ran his finger down the index. Something much worse than the hair thing. Next to him, Remus had tensed up. After a moment, he pushed the book away and stood stretching. I don't know why you think I'll be any help, he insisted, yawning. Sirius grinned. Muggle insight, he said. Like the itching powder. You come up with the stuff that Snape wouldn't see coming. Remus frowned, scratching his head. His lower lip jutted out, the expression he wore whenever he was concentrating on something. I can't think of anything bad enough, he said. Once we got a bucket of water and propped it up over a door, which you have to leave a bit ajar, you know. Then Matron was supposed to walk through it and get soaked, except Matron didn't walk through. Cook did, and we got served shit food for a month. As if on cue, Remus's stomach growled. The boy was always hungry. That's a pretty tame prank, to be honest. You hungry? Can we go down for dinner yet? Yeah, I suppose, Sirius sighed, closing the book. Once Remus started thinking about food, there was no getting him to concentrate on anything else. We could get a bucket pretty easily, but it seems like there's a lot of room for error, and I don't know if it would really strike fear into the heart like we want it to do. When we're orders, we should be setting certain standards. As they climbed through the portrait hole, Remus chuckled to himself. Yeah, told you it was rubbish. Shame, because Snivellus could really do with a good wash. Sirius laughed. A good wash. He froze, struck with inspiration. Oh, you genius! You bloody genius! He reached out to grip Remus's shoulder. What? Remus asked, looking back with a mixture of shock and annoyance, probably irritated that Sirius was delaying his dinner by 30 seconds. A good wash! That's what we'll do. It's easy, I bet. It'll be in one of those books. Wait here. He darted back through the portrait, knowing exactly which book to grab. So wait, explain it to me again, Remus whispered, using the remains of his roast potato to mop up his gravy. They were finishing their plates, speaking in hushed whispers as they hunched over the Gryffindor table. Sounds complicated. It isn't, Sirius assured him. I reckon it's easy. Weather spells are hard on a grand scale, but it only needs to be a cloud the size of his plate. He tapped his fork to the porcelain, emphasising his point. Would it be like the ceiling? Remus asked, jerking his head towards the charmed rafters as he shoved the potato into his mouth. It was raining, matching the dreary weather outside, but of course the water disappeared before it could actually hit them. A bit, Sirius replied, but smaller, and without whatever charms are stopping us from getting wet. But can you just step away from it? Not if we combine it with a binding spell. But we can't mix spells yet. Well, I can't. Can you? Remus paused his eating for a moment to glance up at Sirius, who nodded excitedly. Yeah, I've been having a go at it for your reading thing. It's actually not too hard. You just have to concentrate. That's what they say about reading. That's what they say about reading, Remus said sceptically. We'll practice, Sirius insisted. We'll practice loads before James and Peter get back. They'll be dead impressed. Back in the dorms, Remus continued eating, 
munching on biscuits as Sirius tore through the pages of one of his library books. It was full of weather charms, with no less than 17 rain-related spells, but finally he found one that seemed to be a good fit for his vision. He read the directions aloud several times until they were both sure they understood, and they took it in turns to have a go. Sirius was better at pronunciation, but Remus was a natural when it came to one work, and Sirius had to watch how he twisted his wrist to get it right. It took hours, even with the both of them working together, but as the clock approached midnight, they finally succeeded. Remus managed to cast a small, grey cloud, it slid like smoke from his wand, hovering between them before bursting, almost like a bubble. There was a faint trace of condensation left behind, which dissipated in seconds. Sirius couldn't stop smiling. This is going to work. Sunday, the 31st of December, 1971. Remus was acting weird. He'd been a bit off all weekend. Touchier than usual, more easily frustrated. Restless. Sirius hadn't paid it any mind. He was used to Remus's moods by now. But on Saturday, he kept trying to ditch Sirius. It wasn't as if there was anywhere to go. They were both confined to the school grounds, and Remus didn't exactly have any other friends to hang out with, unless he was suddenly becoming best mates with Frank. At first, Sirius thought his friend might just want some quiet time. That was no problem. They'd grown quite comfortable sitting in companionable silence. But Remus looked annoyed when Sirius brought his library books down to the common room, which was a bit rude, as Sirius had begun lugging heavy books out of the library all week just so that Remus wouldn't have to be alone. Eventually, he said he was feeling sick. They were lying in their room. They were lying on the floor in their room, listening to T-Rex again, and Sirius gamely offered to relocate to the hospital wing, even though there were, there were so very few students there that they'd probably be the only ones there, and he couldn't imagine that the friendly old nurse would mind a bit of music. Sirius was just about to levitate the record player when Remus yelped, No! I I should go alone. His brow knotted in concentration. Sirius stared, perplexed. Why? Well, uh, the spell. You should keep practising. We need to be ready for when classes start back. I've basically got it by now, though. Sirius pointed out, frowning. They'd both managed to procure miniature rainstorms at this point. In fact, they'd very nearly flooded the bathroom. It wasn't it wasn't as if it wasn't as if one night off would set them back. Find something else to do then, Remus snapped, halfway out the door. I'll see you tomorrow. How do you know she'll keep you overnight? But before he could finish his question, Remus slammed the door behind him. Sirius hovered in the middle of the room, stung by his friend's abrupt dismissal. Did Remus just not want to spend time with him? The horrible thought occurred to Sirius that maybe he was acting like Pete, tagging along desperately even when he wasn't wanted. There was a sudden wave of embarrassment, which he expelled immediately with anger. He wasn't like Peter. It wasn't as if he was desperate to hang around Remus. He was perfectly fine all by himself, in fact. In fact, Remus was the one who should be grateful that Sirius was hanging around. If he hadn't come back to Hogwarts, the boy would have spent Christmas alone. So who cared as Remus was being a prick? It wasn't like Sirius needed him anyway. Sirius muttered angrily, storming to the library. Since Remus was so eager to be alone, he might as well spend some more time there, instead of lugging the books back to the common room. But once he arrived... He's found himself unable to concentrate. He kept remembering how Reg had hidden amongst the bookshelves, the morning of the Christmas party when they were trying to avoid Creature. Sirius, bom- Sirius stomped back to the dorm room, putting T-Rex back on, but that made him think of Remus, and how much fun it was to listen to the music with another person. Finally, he gave up and went to the bathroom to practice the storm spell. But even that was a wash. He struggled to concentrate, and ended up soaking his robes. Finally, he stripped off his wet clothes and changed into his pyjamas. It was getting dark, and Remus still wasn't back. Sirius wondered if the nurse really would keep him overnight. He hadn't looked sick. In fact, all day Remus had had more energy than usual. He'd he'd been unable to sit still more than two seconds. 
He had been unable to sit still for more than two seconds. Surely he would be coming back, right? Sirius waited, but Remus didn't return. He rolled over in bed, remembering the other times his friend had disappeared for the night. Was he in the hospital wing, all those times? Did he have some sort of illness that was keeping secret? Did he have some sort of illness that he was keeping secret? Outside, the sky was pitch black. Only remaining light from the moon and... And... The moon. Sirius sat up, staring out the window. A full moon. But that couldn't... It couldn't be... Sirius felt as if his stomach had dropped through the floor. For a moment, he could only stare. Then with a sudden burst of adrenaline, he scrambled out of bed, searching for his astronomy notes and counting the days in his head. Sirius had hardly slept. He was bleary-eyed at breakfast, dizzy from lack of sleep. He'd spent the entire night poring over his astronomy notes. Then he'd moved on to the... Then he'd moved on to Defence Against the Dark Arts, searching for anything relevant. After that, he'd scored through all of his library books, checking to see if he brought anything useful back to the dorm. But there was very little in his notes or books to answer his question. And so Sirius rushed to eat, hurrying to the library immediately when he was done. He dragged an armful of books over to a corner table and devoured them, scouring the pages. Everything fit. The monthly disappearances, the strange moods, the visits to the hospital wing. But but could it really be true? Sirius had thought the reading was a big secret. This was almost unthinkable. Yet the more research, the more certain he became that his hunch was right. Remus Lupin was a werewolf. His heart pounded with the weight of his discovery, and questions swarmed through his mind. How had it happened? And when? Did Dumbledore know? He must. The professor had to know. That must be why Remus went to the hospital wing every month. It'd have some sort of safety measures in place. What was the transformation like? What did it look like? Could Remus remember it? Even as the questions surged, an endless tide, Sirius knew he wouldn't be able to say any of them. If his hunch was right, it was, it had to be. Then Remus had a good reason for keeping it secret. Sirius had always been taught that werewolves were highly dangerous. More beast than man. Obviously, that wasn't true. Not if Remus was any indication. In fact, it never crossed Sirius's mind that he should be frightened or even worried. But he was sure that there would be an uproar in the news if it ever spread around the school. By the afternoon, he was almost completely certain of his conclusion. And just as certain that he could never, ever tell Remus that he had figured it out. Still, the curiosity ate at him. He realised that he badly wanted to see his friend. Luckily, Sirius knew exactly where to find him. Remus was the only student in the hospital wing. He was sleeping, but Madame Pomfrey let Sirius sit next to his bed, whispering, I'm sure he'll be pleased to see a friendly face when he wakes up. Sirius smiled at her as she pulled a chair up for him, and sat down as she bustled away. Remus didn't look any different. Well, there were some bandages, and those dark circles that showed up when he'd been up all night. But he was still the same skinny boy, fuzzy hair that sticked out from his scalp. Fuzzy hair that fuzzy hair sticking out from his scalp. He didn't look like a dangerous creature. He just looked tired. He just looked tired. Sirius rested his chin on his hands, watching his friend sleep. As he waited for Remus to wake, his resolve hardened. Even if the boy was a werewolf, it didn't matter. It didn't change who he was, funny and smart and full of secrets. Sirius would make sure that no one else found out, so that Remus could stay at Hogwarts. They would be planning pranks and listening to music and reading together. Nothing would change. When Remus finally sat up, Sirius eagerly handed him a glass of water. He accepted it wordlessly, drinking deeply, then jumped when he realised who had handed him the glass. Sirius! His voice was raspy. Happy New Year! Sirius crowed. I thought I'd come looking when you went at breakfast. You all right? Fine, Remus said. Fine, Remus said rubbing his head. I, um, I get migraines sometimes. I'm feeling better. Good, Sirius nodded. He'd really need to teach Remus to lie better, somehow, because I've got your Christmas present ready. My what? Remus looked wary, 
like he was expecting this to turn into a joke. Sorry it's late, Sirius said, hardly able to contain his excitement. I had a few last-minute tweaks to make. Here. He passed over the book that he'd bought with him, and Remus's copy... It was Remus's copy of A History of Magic. What? Remus's brow furrowed as he stared down at the title. Open it. Remus did. The pages were crisp, almost like new. Sirius doubted he'd opened that book more than once a year. Sirius doubted he'd opened that book once, all year. Remus did. The pages were crisp, almost like new. Sirius doubted he'd opened that book more than once, all year. Below the title, he'd scored a quick note, and he watched as Remus squinted at it. Sirius, you know I can't. Put your hand on it. Sirius interrupted, stepping forward. Stepping forward. Palm flat against the page. Yeah, like that. Now give it a moment. He lifted his wand, placing it carefully against Remus's temple. His friend's eyes widened, slightly in panic. Sirius, what are you doing? Sirius, what are you doing? Trust me. Sirius hushed him. Sirius shushed him. Concentrating hard, he took a deep breath. Remus squeezed his eyes shut as if he'd been expecting his head to blow off, and Sirius tried not to be offended by his lack of confidence. Lectincula magna. Sirius pronounced the words precisely, putting some force behind them. Remus flinched a bit, and Sirius knew from trying the spell on himself that it didn't exactly feel pleasant, though it wasn't painful. What was that? Remus had opened his eyes, still wary as he gazed up at Sirius. Look at the book, Sirius said eagerly, grinning. Tell me what it says. Remus gave a long, suffering sigh and looked down. Read it, Sirius prompted. I... Remus looked back down and paused, frowning. After a second, he blinked, eyes widening. Sirius watched his entire face light up, mouth breaking out into a broad smile. Remus laughed. He looked up at Sirius, then down at the page. He flipped it open to the middle, staring down at the text. Oh my god. He flipped to another page, eyes scrolling rapidly as he said, Oh my god. It worked then? Sirius asked, thrilled. Sirius, this is you. I can't. How? Oh no. Oh no, Sirius teased. Don't tell me I've messed up your brain so much that you can't even form a coherent sentence. Thank you, Remus said feverently, and Sirius was a bit surprised to see that his eyes looked shiny, as if he might cry. He rubbed at them with his fists, and Sirius looked away, heart beating in his chest. It's okay, he said casually. Now you can help me research for our next big prank. We haven't... We haven't even got the first one off the ground yet, Remus sniffled, smiling. You have to show me how you did this. It's... I mean... It must be really advanced magic. Sort of, Sirius shrugged nonchalantly. I got the idea after Mother's Howler, actually. I thought if you can get a letter to scream at someone, then you can get the book to read to someone. Keeping the voice inside your head was the hardest part. I couldn't tell if it was working on me, or if I was just reading normally. Works on any books, though, I think. Not sure about other stuff yet, like potion labels or signs. But we can keep working on it. Remus was looking back at the book, flipping through the pages in wonder, and Sirius trailed off, smiling. There would be a time to explain it all later. For now, he decided to let his friend enjoy the gift. Chapter 14. First Year, The Prank. Sunday the 2nd of January, 1972. It took a few tries for Remus to get the spell right. Sirius had to coach him through the pronunciation, which was a bit tricky, and although most of the magic seemed to come naturally to Lupin, he was hesitant to perform the spell on himself, especially since he said shyly, Do you mind just doing it for me, until I get the hang of it? No, of course not, Sirius assured him, secretly bursting with pride. He liked being able to do something for Remus. He liked that his friend trusted him enough to even ask. Of course, when the others returned, they had to be a bit more secretive about it. Sirius didn't say anything. He knew Remus was embarrassed about his trouble reading, and he didn't want James or Peter to know. Luckily, they had the perfect distraction. Brilliant, James crowed, breaking into a grin. 
completely brilliant. You're so clever, Peter gushed. They had all crammed into the small shared bathroom. Sirius was positioned in the bathtub, the open umbrella over his head, the only thing keeping his robes from getting drenched as Remus conjured a grey rain cloud above his head. It hovered, pouring rain into the bath below. Sirius shifted up. Sirius shuffled up and down the tub, but the cloud stuck to him, following him about the way Peter did with James. Their two friends had arrived back at Hogwarts just hours ago, but as soon as dinner was over, Sirius and Remus had dragged them upstairs to reveal the fruits of their labour. Lupin gave me the idea, Sirius explained, but I looked up in the charms to do it. But I looked up the charms to do it. He won't know what's hit him. When can we do it? But I looked up the charms to do it. He won't know what's hit him. When can we do it? James was jumping up and down now, unable to contain his excitement. First thing tomorrow, breakfast, potions. Sirius shook his head sagely. Dinner. More of an audience. He'd already thought of this. Yes. Dinner. James agreed immediately. Seriously, you two. I'm so bloody proud. Cheers. Cheers. Sirius raised an eyebrow casually. His heart leapt with the praise. He looked over to Remus. Um, Lupin, you could probably stop now. My feet are getting wet. Oh, Remus shook off the charm, looking down at the tub. He had produced more rain than the ancient plug hole could manage leaving Sirius ankle-deep in cold water. Sorry. It's fine, Sirius laughed, squeezing out his robes and stepping out of the tub. Just make sure to do the same to Snape. So Lupin is the one doing it? James asked. Remus shrugged. He's better at it. I can do it too, though, if we get interference. Monday the 3rd of January, 1972. It was getting easier, admitting stuff like that. One side effect of spending all his time around James and Remus was that Sirius had to accept that he simply wouldn't be the best at everything any longer. And they were much tougher competition than Regulus. But he found that he enjoyed the challenge of competing with James, who regardless who, regardless of whether he won or lost, always concluded the competition with a broad grin and a friendly pat on the back. He could hardly hold it against Remus, who was so shy about his talent with magic that he acted baffled any time he came first in something. On the first day of lessons after Christmas, Sirius was buzzing with energy, wishing he could turn time forward to dinner. He hung back with Lupin as the other boys went down to breakfast, quickly performing his reading spell to the other boy. Remus was still struggling a bit to get it down, but that was all right. None of them could be best at everything, and Lupin would be the star of the show when it came to their spell tonight. The day dragged by, minutes crawling like molasses, as Sirius listened to their professors drone on and on. James and Peter were fidgeting too, a mirror of his own nervous energy. Remus, on the other hand, seemed completely absorbed by the classes. Sirius smiled to himself as he watched his friend consult their text repeatedly, a look of wonder on his face. It was clear the reading had made a difference. Remus was the first student to get his brick to bounce in charms, mastering the spell after glancing over his book. But even the satisfaction of watching Remus put his reading to good use wasn't enough to alleviate the energy bottled up inside of Sirius. And by that afternoon, he was strung tight, tense. They had potions with the Slytherins, which meant seeing Snape and thinking about the prank and tasting vengeance just out of reach on the tip of his tongue. Slowcon. Slughorn. Slughorn was returning their essays on the twelve uses of dragon blood. Sirius and Remus had done those together, and the Marauders as a whole did, did fairly well. Peter, predictably, was at the bottom of the pack. But of course, Snape got the highest mark and earned five points for Slytherin. The sight of the smug smile made Sirius want to punch him in the face. He had expected his own essay would come second as he had always been good with words. Sirius prepared to hear Slughorn call his name, and perhaps that's why he felt a sharp jolt of shame when it wasn't him, but Lily Evans, the muggle-born girl, who came second and got a point for Gryffindor. He flushed as he listened to their professor read her score. She had only beaten him by a few marks. Snape gave her an oily smile, 
and she grinned back at him, cheeks pink. Sirius felt a surge of irritation, and before he knew it, he was opening his mouth. Wonder if it's worth cozying up to Snivellus just for one measly house point. He kept his voice low enough to not draw Slughorn's attention, but made sure that Snape and his little girlfriend could hear. Lily spun around, blushing. Shut up, Black, she hissed. No one likes a sore loser. This just made him angry. He hissed back immediately, hardly losing when your boyfriend lets you copy his work. I did not copy him, and Severus is not my boyfriend. Now her face was almost red as her hair. Sirius sunk his teeth in. You're blushing, Evans, he smirked, nudging James. Isn't that sweet? James snickered, nodding along. Ignore them, Lily. Ignore them, Lily, Snape whispered, but turned back to them. They're just jealous. Jealous of what, Snivellus? James said quickly, still quiet enough to avoid drawing the professor's attention. Jealous of a slimy, greasy git like you? Keep dreaming. Sirius laughed, bolstered by James's support. Peter laughed too, trying to involve himself as usual. Slughorn still hadn't noticed them. He was scribbling instructions on the blackboard, his back turned. Remus seemed to be ignoring them as well, more interested in flipping through his book. At James's provocation... <laughs> Whoa. Provocation? Provocation? At James's provocation, Snape finally turned around and sneered at Sirius. I hear you've had a very quiet Christmas, Black. His beady little eyes narrowed in with malice. Your family couldn't stand to have you around for more than a few days before packing you off back to school. Is that right? His lip curled cruelly. All of the plural blood families are talking about it. The Black's black sheep. Sirius's blood turned to ice. Oh God, did everyone know? He imagined all the Slytherins whispering about it, thinking they were better than him, listening to Bella's mean laughs as she recounted dinner, as she recounted the dinner party. He clenched his fists, impotent with anger. He wanted to say something clever, something biting and sharp, but all that came out was, shut your face. Not his best moment. Luckily, James came to the rescue, frowning as he said, yeah, watch it, Snape. You'd better be careful what you say. Never know what might happen. Is that a threat, Potter? Snape drawled, sounding bored. Forgive me if I'm not quaking in my boots. Going to set Looney Lupin on me again. Remus, who hadn't even really been paying attention, flinched at the jab. His brows knotted, and he moved immediately to pick up his wand, all his attention now on Snape, who smirked, saying, Oh my, you have actually learnt some magic, Lupin. I'm impressed. Mind you, I've heard they can train some monkeys to perform basic tricks. Uh, so I suppose there's no real achievement. Remus raised his wand. He could be more impulsive than Sirius sometimes. Still struggling with his own fury, Sirius grabbed his friend's wrist and pushed it back down to the desk. Not yet, he muttered. They couldn't let all their hard work be for nothing. Remus clenched his jaw and looked back at the blackboard. One still held tightly in his fist. Sirius was still seething too, but he ignored Snape as he chuckled and turned back around. Lily whispered, there's no need to be so horrid to him. For the rest of the lesson, Sirius thought of nothing but their revenge. He had already focused the brunt of his anger on Snape, but with Christmas break, there had been some time since the hair prank, and the sting of it had died a bit. Now, the wound was fresh again. Sirius wanted nothing more than to humiliate Severus, to make him feel small. Although Remus remained quiet throughout the rest of the day, Sirius could tell that the other boy shared his anger, he wasn't exactly sure what it was about the loony looping comment that stuck with Remus, but his friend hardly touched his dinner and kept glaring at Snape from across the hall when they finally sat down to eat. Sirius scowled as he watched the Slytherins nudging each other and pointing towards the marauders. Were they all talking about him? Lily noticed the dark looks on their faces and piped up, saying sternly, You lot just leave Sev alone, okay? This stupid fight is going to go on forever, if no one can be mature enough to... Give it a rest, Evans, James rolled his eyes. 
Bad enough that you have to be friends with the tosser. Now you're trying to defend him? Where's your house loyalty, eh? This is nothing to do with houses, Lily insisted. Indignant. It's a ridiculous spat over nothing. He insulted Remus. And you pick on him all the time. He started it. Oh, yeah? So you'll be the one to finish it, right, Potter? She burst out of her seat, picking up her bag. God, you're all so full of yourselves. She stormed away, moving to sit further down the table. Love's a good fight, that one. James stared dopely after her. Back at the Slytherin table, there was a yelp of laughter. Remus snapped, apparently deciding that he'd had enough. He stood up and pulled out his wand, even though he was supposed to wait for Sirius's signal. Lingar Peluvium. It worked immediately, faster than it ever had before. The rain cloud shot from the end of Remus's wand, so fast that Sirius could hardly make it out until it was already hanging over Snape's head. The cloud settled in place, grey and bloated, rumbling with thunder. The downpour began. At first, he was frozen with shock, gaping at the storm cloud that had appeared, seemingly out of nowhere. As water pelted against Snape's face, the other students hurriedly scooted away, trying to avoid the deluge. He leapt to his feet after a moment, trying to dodge out of its way. But the cloud stuck to him like glue, following his movements. It was perfect. Remus's best work yet. Yes, Sirius hissed into his friend's ear. Bloody yes, Lupin, you beauty. Remus was grinning, eyes still focused on Snape. Although he'd sat down and concealed his wand so that no one could tell that he was behind the magic. That was good. Students were laughing now and looking around the hall trying to see who was casting the spell. But no one had seen Remus move except the marauders. Sirius felt a mean twist of pleasure as he watched Severus try desperately to escape the storm. All the anger and frustration he'd been wrestling with finally had an outlet. As Snape's word from their earlier class echoed in his head, and he thought to himself, I hope you choke, you rat. As if Remus had read his thoughts, the cloud began to grow larger and darker. Snape was, indeed, beginning to splutter a bit now. Eyes squinted shut against the rain. His robes were completely drenched. A puddle had already formed around him on the floor. As the downpour thickened, genuine panic crossed his features. Good, Sirius thought savagely. Stop it! Lily was screeching at James. I know it's you! Stop it now! James held his hands up, laughing, to show that he wasn't doing anything. Lily looked like she might cry, which made Sirius want to roll his eyes. It wasn't as if a little rain could hurt anyone. Severus made to run holding his arms furtively over his head, which seemed pointless, as his hair was already plastered to his forehead. But his robes were so heavy and waterlogged that he half tripped, half slid and collapsed onto the floor. Sirius laughed. Next to him, Remus was still working the spell. Sirius watched, awestruck, as the rain began to fall even harder, until Severus was hardly visible through the storm. There was even thunder and lightning crackling in the cloud now. Chapter 15. First Year. Aftermath. The Gryffindor common room was crowded with gossiping students. Everyone was chattering, talking about who it could be behind the prank. Apparently Snape had managed to piss off quite a few different people. Sirius wondered vaguely if there was anyone who liked him, aside from Lily. He followed his friends to their room, where the mood was silent and sombre. Remus sat on his bed and stared at the floor, looking sick with guilt and James watched him apprehensively. Sirius wanted to shake them both. That was probably the coolest magic any first year had ever done. What happened? James asked carefully. Did you lose control of it? That was really strong magic. Lose control. Losing control of the spell made the cloud dissipate. The rain fade away. What Remus had done took precision, power, Sirius couldn't keep quiet any longer. It was amazing, he said fiercely. He'll think twice about crossing us again. But, I mean, we didn't want to hurt him, did we? James frowned. He's fine. He was just pretending to get us in trouble. Will we get in trouble? Peter piped up, fidgeting nervously. 
We didn't all do it, did we? It was only... Sirius slapped him around the back of the head. You rat! He shook his head, disgusted. We're marauders. All for one and one for all. Peter narrowed his eyes, muttering, whatever that means, and going to sulk off on his own bed. I did it. You lot shouldn't get in trouble, Rima said mor morosely. Eyes still glued to the floor. It was half my idea, Sirius reminded him, and I did the research. Don't worry, Lupin. I bet everything's fine. But Remus continued moping. If he is, then it's no thanks to me. Sirius wanted to roll his eyes. Why are all his friends acting like girls? But then Remus looked up at James, gazed steady, and said, I did mean to hurt him. Sirius released a breath, but Remus wasn't looking at him. He was speaking to James. There was a knock at the door interrupting whatever James might have said. It was Frank Longbottom. The four of you are to come to McGonagall's office, now, he told them. He was acting like someone had died, and for the first time Sirius felt a spike of worry. They hadn't hurt Snivellus, right? So what if they did? He thought to himself, furiously, trying to dispel with anxiety. He deserved it. Everyone stared as they made their way through the common room, and Sirius lifted his chin instinctively, daring anyone to say anything. He refused to feel bad about what they'd done. For Pete's sake, it was just some water. Dumbledore stood beside the desk of McGonagall's office, watching them sincerely. He smiled pleasantly as they lined up in front of him. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, headmaster, they all chanted back. You may be interested to know. You may be interested to know that young Mr. Snape is quite well, though his pride will be rather wounded. A hot surge of vindication, he knew Severus was faking, and Sirius tried to catch Remus's eye, but the other boy was staring firmly at the floor. He seemed to think that the four of you had something to do with his misfortune, Dumbledore continued, smile still in place. Particularly you, Mr. Potter. James looked up, opened his mouth, then closed it and looked down. One for all and all for one. It's not like they'd be able to prove any... It was me, sir. I did it. Remus had stepped forward. He was speaking quickly. He said some stuff to me earlier. I was pissed off with him. I wanted to teach him a lesson. Sirius groaned internally. If they had just stayed quiet, they might have gotten away with it. But of course, Remus had to play the martyr. I see. I see. Dumbledore nodded. You acted alone? Yes, Remus pulled out his wand. Look, I can prove it. No need, Dumbledore said hurriedly. I believe you, Mr Lupin. What Remus had forgotten was that they were marauders. All for one and one for all. It wasn't just him, sir, Sirius spoke up. I looked up the spell. I learnt how to do it. It's pretty much my fault. You mean you planned this, Black? McGonagall said sharply. You planned an attack on another pupil? Ten points from Gryffindor. Each. Sirius flushed, realising his mistake. Remus, clever as always, made it sound like a one-off thing. But now Sirius had spoken without thinking again. And detention for all of you for a month, she continued. I find it very hard to believe that Mr Lupin acted alone. Sirius hung his head, feeling a little guilty that he'd accidentally made things worse. You may go. Gentlemen, Dumbledore said quietly. I have no doubt that you will all take some time to apologise to Mr. Snape. Of course. Sirius snorted indignantly. If anything, he was angrier with Snape now, for pretending to be hurt and then tattling to get them all in trouble. They hadn't run and told him about the hair prank, and Sirius felt that the Slytherin broke the unspoken pranking code of honour. But James elbowed him roughly before he could protest. They turned to leave. Mr. Lupin, just a moment. Next to them, Remus froze. Sirius glanced back at him as the door shut behind them. His face had gone white as a sheet. They tried to wait outside, but McGonagall shooed them away, threatening to lengthen their detention if they didn't return to their dormitory immediately. The common room had mostly cleared out by the time they got back, but they still got a few curious stares as they made their way back to their room. Sirius waited until the door was safely shut behind them before he burst out. That slimy little snitch! I could kill him! 
but he paced in front of his bed, edgy with frustration. Peter sat down on his own bed, muttering darkly, Lupin might have beat you to it. Sirius froze. What's that supposed to mean? As usually when confronted, Pete backpedalled immediately, wide-eyed under the weight of his friend's angry glare. Nothing, he squeaked defensively. I just, well, he did say that he was trying to hurt him, didn't he? You heard Dumbledore. Snape's fine. He was just faking to get us in trouble. Now James chimed in, horrified on Pete's behalf, saying carefully, We know, mate, but you do have to admit that Remus did go a bit overboard. Sirius stared at his friends, incredulous. Just whose side are you on, anyway, then? Come on, this is not about sides, it's just... Now you're starting to sound like Evans. Sniveller's got exactly what was coming to him. I know! James ran a hand through his hair, exasperated. I'm not trying to argue that. Just, well, you'd think we should be a little worried about Remus. Worried? Sirius crossed his arms, disbelieving. Come on, come on, he'd never actually hurt anyone. Had Peter and James never been angry before? Everyone wanted to hurt people, sometimes, but it didn't mean you were actually going to do it. Remus was just being honest earlier. I didn't mean it like that. James held his hands up, surrendering. I just meant... Do you think he's okay? Sirius blinked. Okay? You spent Christmas together, Peter chimed in. Right? Did he seem all right then? Sirius paused, thinking about this discovery of the full moon, the hospital wing, the disappearances, but... Remus is fine, he said firmly. I told you, the whole thing wasn't even his idea. I just dragged him into it. He sighed, finally sitting down in his bed. James watched him for a moment, evaluating, and then nodded. Right then, he clapped his hands together, as if to physically dispel the tension from the room, and smiled. Aside from all that, it was a bloody cool prank, wasn't it? By the time Remus returned, all had been forgiven. Peter and Sirius were playing chess, and James was in the bathroom, getting ready for bed. When the door opened, Sirius jumped up. Peter had been about to check his king, and he was privately relieved to have an excuse to abandon the game. Remus had barely made it two steps into the room before Sirius exclaimed, You're back! What did Dumbledore want? Peter looked up, frowning from his chessboard, and James poked his head out the bathroom, toothbrush sticking out of his mouth. Remus shifted uncomfortably. Nothing, he muttered, walking to his bed. Just ask me about a spell. Really? Sirius followed him over to the bed, where he was sitting down to take off his shoes. What about it? Did he want to know how we'd done it? Did you show him? No, I... He was just telling me not to do it again. Oh, well, did he say anything about... Look, I'm a bit tired. Can we talk about it later? Remus stood abruptly, turning his back to them as he grabbed his pyjamas. Sirius tried not to let the dismissive tone sting. Sure, he mumbled, watching Remus brush by James on his way out of the bathroom. He slammed the door behind him with a bit more force than necessary, and when he came back out, he went straight to bed, drawing the curtains... The other boys went to sleep soon after. Sirius really didn't want to finish the chess game with Peter, and pretended he was tired too. Once he heard Peter's steady breathing, though, he crept over to James's bed. They'd both learnt how to do silencing spells the week before Christmas break, when he'd accidentally woken Peter one night. Sirius cast one now as he climbed into James's bed, and the other boy sat up as if he'd been expecting him. Hiya. Hey. What's up? Do you think Remus is mad at me? James blinked. What? He seems a bit mad, doesn't he? Sirius chewed his lip. Do you reckon he's annoyed with me? Since I sort of convinced him to do the spell. The thought of Remus's dismissive attitude, the way he'd slammed the door, the way he'd refused to meet Sirius's gaze earlier in McGonagall's office. Do you think he blames me for getting him in trouble? James frowned, considering for a moment. Nah, he shook his head. I think he's just feeling bad. What, about Snivellus? Yeah, seemed like he felt pretty guilty earlier. I think he's blaming himself. Sirius snorted. <laughs> well, that's dumb. Snape didn't even get hurt. James yawned, shrugging. If you're that worried about it, why don't you just try talking to him tomorrow? Sirius nodded, thinking. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Maybe I'll talk to him tomorrow. 
but Remus wasn't in a very talkative mood the next day, or the one after, or the one after that. In fact, he started avoiding the marauders again, the way he had, well, before they were marauders. The only difference now was that when he snuck off, he usually had a book in hand. In fact, he seemed to spend all his spare time reading or working on homework. Sirius was happy for him, of course. Remus started pulling ahead in class, quickly becoming one of the top students. But he didn't realise how much he actually enjoyed their private reading sessions until they were over. Remus didn't ask him to help with lenticular magna anymore. It might not have been so bad, studying together, except Sirius didn't want to spend his time studying. McGonagall had split them up for their detentions and purposely chose some of the most difficult tasks to perform without magic. Peter had it the easiest. He was just polishing trophies. But James had to recalibrate the telescopes in the astronomy tower by hand and Sirius was forced to scrub out all the cauldrons in the potions classroom. Poor Remus had it worst of all, mucking out the hourry every night. So when they weren't in classes or detentions, Sirius preferred to spend his time planning pranks or exploring the castle using James's invisibility cloak. Inspired by Remus's initial discovery of the passageway in the girls' bathroom, he was determined to catalogue every hidden passage that he could find, and there was supposed to be a monster somewhere in the castle, which sounded devastatingly cool. James and Peter were happy to go along with these adventures, eagerly whispering about dung bombs and colour-changing taffies and huddling under the cloak to sneak out at night. But every time they tried to include Remus, he ignored them, pretending to be sleeping or giving some half-hearted excuse about studying. Sirius was at a loss of what to do. Over Christmas break, he thought they were making progress. Remus had opened up more. They'd both grown much more comfortable around each other. Sirius thought back to the long hours they'd spent listening to T-Rex and playing games of Exploding Snap, missing his friend. Hanging out with James and Peter was great, but it wasn't the Marauders without all of them there. Despite his best efforts, as January drew to a close, Remus was still very much giving them the cold shoulder. Sirius couldn't shake the feeling that the other boy was upset with him about the prank, but he didn't act angry. On the contrary, he was perfectly polite, and would still eat dinner with the other boys, smiling at their jokes and sharing his notes when they asked. But he was still distant, some impenetrable barrier once more separating him from the rest of them. When he wasn't adventuring with James or Peter or cursing Snape's name in detention, Sirius was trying to figure out what he could do to make Remus snap out of his funk, and he wondered if he would ever stand a chance of understanding the infuriating boy.